Thanks very much, Tom. Our uh, third and final speaker today in the session is Dr. Haim Benaroya. Dr. Benaroya is a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Rutgers University. His research interests are focused on the conceptualization and analysis of structures placed in challenging environments like offshore drilling rigs, various aircraft structures, and as we'll see, lunar and Martian colonies designed for human habitation. Professor Benaroya earned his bachelor's degree in engineering from the Cooper Union in New York and his MS and PhD degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining uh, the faculty at Rutgers University in 1989, he spent eight years conducting defense-related studies as a senior research engineer at Widlinger Associates in New York City. Since joining the faculty at Rutgers, he has taught countless students, authored 70 referee journal articles, and written four books on a wide range of topics from vibration analysis to probabilistic modeling to the dynamics of ocean-based structures. His uh, most recent book, um, which was published in 2010 by Springer Praxis, is called From Dust to Gold, Building a Future on the Moon and Mars. And I think this is right, you'll be signing this at the conclusion of our session, and that's down at the, uh, the museum store just down the hall. So please welcome me in welcoming Dr. Haim Benaroya. So let me say it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to be here. I want to thank uh, Roger and, uh, and Eric for including me in this. And uh, uh, I've, uh, I've studied uh, uh, lunar settlements and concepts for lunar structures for over 20 years. And I, I would also have to say that all those studies were totally unfunded because it, it has been so difficult to find funding for that. But I, it's something I do as a passion. And I, I try to pass that on to my students. And, uh, I get endless students into my office from freshman year on who want to participate in this, and I think that uh, um, one of the great benefits of, of space uh, studies is the inspiration not only for students, but also for, for all of us. So um, I start off with a busy slide, just to give you an idea that uh, going to the moon and living on the moon is not purely an engineering, uh, engineering task. Um, I list the, the top three are non-engineering such as human physiology, human psychology, uh, just the ability to keep things alive in space. And then we see a whole list of engineering types of uh, issues, and I end the list with economics and, and, and lunar tourism. In order to be viable, in order to become a space-faring civilization, we have to actually make it an economically viable activity eventually. So here's a, a picture of Robert Goddard, 1926, uh, an American pioneer in uh, rocketry. And here's a picture from, of Yuri Gagarin. This is the Evening Moscow newspaper from April 12, 1961, after he went into space. And I believe what the, red, uh, the red letters on top basically say, Soviet man conqueror of space. And for those of you who are roughly my age and know the honeymooners, you've, you've heard of Alice Cramden, who really was the first person on the moon. This is like in the late 50s, and you can see our astronauts discovering her up there. So Ralph finally did it. This is an actual, uh, the, the Florida Today, uh, a picture of uh, the bottom President Nixon uh, speaking to the astronauts and uh, uh, basically a photograph of a TV uh, image of them wa working on the moon. This is Harrison Schmidt uh, of our last Apollo 17. Uh, he was a geologist uh, and uh, was uh, gathering some samples for future study. And this is a picture from uh, Arthur C. Clarke's book uh, he was, uh, as probably most of you know, he was also a, a scientist and engineer. And this is a, an engineering book of his. I talk about settling the moon and uh, all kinds of space exploration. And this is an interesting image because uh, it shows some of the early concepts of what they thought lunar bases would look like. Uh, and if you look at some of the latest later art that I'll show you, you'll see that they all, uh, some of the early concepts, the first generation lunar bases will be uh, egg-shaped or, or soup can-shaped because of the structural properties of those kinds of systems. So looking at this as an engineer, uh, if you're a part of a design firm and you're called up to design a base for the moon, what would you be worrying about? So what engineers do, of course, is they basically understand the environment, whatever that environment might be, and then they design to uh, adapt to that environment. So a structural engineer has to figure out what kind of forces and environment their structure has to sur uh, survive, and then design that structure. So the lunar environment being a very challenging environment, uh, challenges engineers with one-sixth Earth gravity. Uh, we have to pressurize these structures in order to be able to live in them in short sleeve. 
and then we have to protect the people inside from radiation and micrometeorites, very large temperature differentials and going from daytime to nighttime. Uh, and, uh, and, and you'll see many of the sample uh, art that, that shows concepts for lunar bases show about two to three feet, about 10 feet of regolith, the lunar, the lunar topsoil that's used to cover for shielding against some of these uh, negative effects. In addition to these, uh, the Apollo astronauts uh, saw that the, the regolith dust uh, being electrostatically charged would, would cling to everything. So if you look at old videos of the astronauts walking on the lunar surface, you'll see the dust starting to, to uh, almost become like a fog and basically uh, stay that way for long periods of time and attach to themselves because they were elect electrostatic, they were attached to the spacesuits, and they were extremely abrasive. Uh, they're basically uh, a carcinogenic if breathed in, uh, and, and the astronauts actually ended up dragging some of this into, into the, um, the capsules, and it was found even within the space suits. Uh, the last topic there was the, the, the issue of moonquakes. One doesn't think of uh, moonquakes as we do earthquakes. These are tidally generated moonquakes, uh, quakes, and they, they last on the order of about uh, five times as long as earthquakes. Even though they're lower magnitude, uh, they could be a challenge for structures placed on the lunar surface. So there are all kinds of other issues, as I mentioned, the psychological issues, the physiological issues. These are very challenging uh, issues, that, as some speakers have spoken about before. So looking back during the Apollo era, we see some of the early concepts of, of bases. These are a couple of Boeing concepts. And you can see that um, regolith, the, the, the inset at the top right, is being placed on top of this structure. Here we see um, some other possible bases, horizontal cylinders, vertical cylinders. So these are viewed as most likely the first generation lunar bases placed on, on the surface, even though ideally, eventually, we'll place them underground. Here are some uh, images uh, from Carter Emmert, who's at the Museum of Natural History, a space artist, among other things, just showing some conceptualizations of future bases. We see here um, solar panels being unrolled in a crater, uh, eventually for a generation of power. Uh, a, a fairly advanced base. In the back you see um, a greenhouse, which you can see here. There's an astronaut on the outside and somebody in, in shirts the inside tending the plants. And there are many other kinds of uh, uh, very very visionary kinds of structures that people have thought about. Gerard, Gerard O'Neill of the Space Studies Institute in Princeton uh, thought of orbital cities. Uh, why bother going to a planet? Just build your own basically civilization in space in a toroidal structure. Uh, that can house somewhere around 250,000 people, generating its own artificial gravity. And here's a concept from Shimizu, the Japanese construction firm, for an orbital hotel. So these ideas are all out there, some of them very visionary. And here's an ad from Century 21, uh, back in, I think, mid-2002, 2002, basically offering half-crater lots for people who want to have a, a summer home on the moon. And I'm not sure how far away we are from that, but it's a, it's a nice idea, a nice marketing uh, ad. And uh, various uh, ideas have been put forward for, for going to the moon. Why go there? Uh, there are more uh, elements of use on the moon than one might think. And I'll talk about this as uh, a resource for eventual civilizations on the moon. A mining for various, uh, various elements, for energy. So we see here a breakdown of the, the key elements that we see on the moon, 42% of the regolith is oxygen, a very large percentage. But if you look at the other elements, silicon, magnesium, calcium, iron, aluminum, these are all elements that are uh, the backbone of an industrial society and can form uh, basically uh, the basis for being self-sufficient on the moon, which is gonna be required. And what I say about the moon obviously applies to Mars and any, any place else which would go in the solar system. So we see some of these early concepts, the cylinders, we see cylinders uh, pulled together into larger complexes of modules. Uh, again, a cylinder. Um, we see a rocket taking off. A lot of the space arc has rockets taking off. It makes it very dynamic. Here's an orbital sciences um, concept. On the right in the insert, you can see that there's regolith built into that, even though you can't see it on the, on the other drawing. And here are some NASA concepts for uh, creating shielding by way of electro electromagnetic forces. So the shielding, uh, so, so these, these cylinders basically create a field that deflects the radiation. So a few years ago, we, we wanted to see whether we could design what a first structure might look like. I'll just give you a few, uh, a few of the concepts. So we wanted to do something that's simple and, and more or less realistic, so we did an igloo kind of structure composed of two arches 
and, and a, a tie in the base that would hold it all together. So we, it's about 15, uh, 15 feet tall, five meters, and uh, you see the habitable space. And we applied a factor of safety of five, meaning that there's a lot of there's extreme uncertainty in, in some of the parameters. So we wanted to see if we use existing design codes, whether we can come up with a structure. You see here uh, on the right the, the, the loads due to the regolith shielding, and on the left you can see the internal pressurization forces. And we, we use a double I-beam aluminum, although we go back, I think, and change the aluminum uh, to other elements uh, for structural strength. And we have to design a connection, because anytime you pressurize something from the inside, what you worry about is that the oxygen escapes, so the connections become extremely important. And there's the end panel where the stress is showing. And, and when you design a structure, you worry about how do you construct it? What is the sequence? And so we see here first the base and then a temporary scaffolding. The first arch comes in. Then we bring in the second, connect everything, put the end panels, and then internally pressurize it. And it would look like this. So, this, so the igloo is a nice concept because you can generalize it to almost any kind of need that you might have. And this is a concept uh, drawn by an artist at the uh, Star Ledger or a symposium we held back at Rutgers a few years ago, showing how it might look on the lunar surface. So if you go to second generation and third generation, you want to use more and more local resources because you can't bring everything to the moon. It's extremely expensive. So, so here are, here's an inflatable, uh, spherical inflatable structure. This is a conceptual drawing by Gary Hitmacher, who's uh, a NASA engineer and obviously artist. So the inflatable structures were, were, were a good concept because it basically allowed you to carry the structure with you in a small volume and then be able to actually inflate it and then make it rigid for, for permanent use. And you can see this is a, 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 this is a symposium on innovation and, and imagination. So this inflatable concept was actually patented in the hopes that eventually it would be adopted. Another uh, very uh, creative idea is to use an existing crater that could be cleaned up uh, you, you uh, put cables around the top and you cover it and then you pressurize it. So you have this large volume again that's pressurized and very useful for, for humans to work in. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, eventually we want to go underground for, for the reasons of shielding and, and, uh, and just safety. And uh, lava tubes were discovered on, on the moon and therefore are potential locations for underground structures. Uh, there have been many concepts for deployable structures. And these are uh, NASA concept, concepts for pressurized rovers. If you have a base on the moon, eventually you want to go out somewhere and you want to be able to uh, uh, live away from the base. So these become bases eventually. Here's a similar concept for mining rovers called Haybots, habitable robots. And, and tourism uh, is, will eventually go to the moon. We see a, a picture drawn a drawing by London architect uh, Peter Inston for Hilton International. You can see the external view and the internal view of a large space hotel uh, concept for the lunar surface. And here's the Lunar Marriott. This is also a picture you probably haven't seen. It looks a lot like the, like the Hilton, uh, like a little bit different than the Hilton. But this is the actual Marriott from um, a magazine cover, a little bit more realistic. And in low gravity and microgravity, you have a lot of things that you can do, and people have conceptualized how would sports be. Uh, in, in microgravity, in orbit, uh, uh, water basically becomes a, a sphere. And so you see here a, a low gravity swimming pool. So you dive in. The only problem is that buoyancy, which brings you back up to the surface, doesn't exist in, in low gravity. It's, it's the gravity that takes you out of there. So once you dive into the middle, you're going to stay there unless you can pull yourself out of there. So just a warning. Uh, here's a low gravity uh, football. Uh, there was an NFL uh, football presentation to NASA uh, a number of years ago where uh, they, they suggested not only throwing the football but also throwing the football player because it, because of low gravity through the through the goal an interesting idea too I have a few uh, slides from uh, from some Russian colleagues showing you what they what they view as possible fu future bases these are uh, title 2050 not very likely but uh, you can see the ideas of very extensive facilities top view you can see all the uh, different uh, parts of the space, really a full city on, on the lunar surface, uh, and also facilities that are, are mostly buried. So you can see how uh, a, a site has been excavated, uh, the structure is built, and then refilled again. And this is a, a base in a lava tube concept. And uh, this leads me to the idea that you have to basically use uh, 
in situ resources. You have to be able to use as much as possible what you find on the moon and then build your bases that way. Just like people, uh, when, when settlers went west in, in the Americas, they didn't, they didn't bring all their building materials with them. So eventually, we'd like to be able to use uh, a lot of the materials that are existing on the moon and Mars to actually build the structures and hopefully robotically. We want to do it robotically uh, for these reasons. I won't go through it, but the radiation, uh, EVAs are very strenuous for astronauts and just transporting costs, uh, transporting costs of materials to the moon or Mars is extremely pro and prohibitively expensive. So you want to be able to send robots to the moon, send robots to Mars or the asteroids long before people get there. Uh, and then these robots would then uh, start processing the materials that are there, and they would start building what we need, and a year later the astronauts would come. Uh, and some of, the, some of these technologies are already being developed, uh, the technologies such as 3D printing, um, and I'll show you some, uh, I won't go through these elements again, I don't know how time, time is short. Uh, 3D printing allows you to create very, very uh, complex uh, systems and structures. For example, this, uh, this what looks like art, is a very complicated uh, structure. And so is a company that has developed a process that goes from a CAD model, computer-aided model, that builds a 3D structure. It looks like this. And you can see this is a very large structure, six meters by six meters by 12 meters, like a small house. Uh, and, and this company is actually looking at applying this to using regolith on the lunar surface to build structures. So in this conceptualized drawing, you see robots on Mars and they're able to process the, the Martian, uh, Martian soil and, uh, and build structures for eventual habitation by humans. Uh, very briefly, I want to mention the space elevator, which I'm sure have, you have heard and has come out of science fiction. Basically, it's a, uh, the idea is it's a 60,000 mile ribbon made out of carbon nanotubes orbiting the Earth that comes down to the surface of the Earth upon which elevator-like structures can climb and thereby totally uh, obviating the need for, for rockets, cutting the cost uh, from $10,000 a pound to $100 a pound to bring something into low Earth orbit. So here's a, a nice artist rendering of what a space elevator might look like. And in a minute, I'll close this talk with uh, a, a nice video that will impress you, I think. So just to conclude, you know, the next generation issues, what might, what might they be? Uh, they certainly are technological. Uh, but there are other issues, like legal issues of ownership. Currently, if you go and build a a factory on the lunar surface, you really don't own anything uh, of that factory or what you're making because the legal structure isn't there. So we want to balance economic development with safeguarding the environment. Uh, we want democratic principles to govern the processes there. And then new generations eventually will have new physiology and new psychology. Uh, and, uh, and from history, one can, gen one can basically extrapolate that these new generations will have new loyalties and eventually will demand independence. So these are issues that are larger issues and the ones that we don't have to really totally worry about now, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. So some, some sh shameless uh, uh, promotion. If, Tom, if, if uh, Tom can do it, I can do it. Uh, here's the cover of my book, uh, Springer Praxis. It has that illustration from before. And I just draw from that book. I wrote the book as though it were written in 2169 as a history book uh, as, as to how we, how we went through uh, from being uh, not a space-faring civilization to having colonies everywhere. So I had to pick some timeline for certain things, such as uh, when the first birth was on the moon, fusion reactors, space elevators, uh, terraforming of Mars. So it's an interesting exercise. Uh, and OK, terrific. Just want to thank all of our panelists again. And uh, I think we'll probably have uh, 15 or 20 minutes for questions. So uh, please go ahead and tell us who you are. Hi, my name is Stephen. Uh, very enjoyable, thank you. A uh, couple quick questions. Dr. Tom, on the, if they do send commercial venues, will the people that go, will they have to have some sort of a physical test so they don't go into cardiac arrest because of the stress of going on the trip? We'll have to test something for physical fitness. It's a good question. I think that the commercial folks will probably be pretty lax. Uh, they won't have to be too rigid on their medical requirements. I can tell you from my shuttle experience that everybody here in the room would survive a space shuttle trip. Uh, it's just not that physically demanding. I think the G levels will be a little bit higher on these suborbital cannonball style trips than the three Gs that we experienced on the shuttle. Uh, but they're going to get uh, the you know the commercial travelers on these uh, ships will get several days of training and screening to make sure that they're in good general health. But I just don't see the stresses as being that uh, demanding. Okay. Well, uh, 
two quick questions and one to you that you can answer quickly afterwards. What was your biggest concern when you would go out in for a spacewalk? You can answer that in a minute. And then as a group, now that you don't have any government funding, over the past 10 years, has maybe the hands been kind of tied on innovation, and now that it's opened up to the free market, might it really allow itself for more innovation? Uh, my spacewalk worries were whether or not I would work quickly enough and efficiently enough to finish all the work that they put in our six and a half hour schedule. And to give you an example, six and a half hour planned spacewalk the first day, uh, we ran into a, a leak of one of our coolant lines and had to deal with that unexpected uh, fluid leak. And we managed to recover from that and get the uh, leak stopped, get the line connected. Then we had to decontaminate both of our spacesuits. Worked out to be about seven and a half hours outside. Uh, and we got, I think we got everything done uh, on that first EVA, but this took an hour longer. So that was really my big worry. Could we fit everything in? Turned out the second two spacewalks, we got ahead of the schedule and we actually had a little bit of time to actually look back at the Earth and just enjoy the incredible view out the visor. I think that was my most emotional moment in space was to take advantage of five minutes of free time outside and look at black space like in this room above us, uh, the golden solar panels, the view 200 miles down past my boots, and you know, tears came to my eyes. So that was a precious um, free five minutes, and I'm so glad that we worked hard and got ahead of schedule. And as far as uh, your second question, I think the key to the future of, of space exploration is innovation on the commercial side to help the government make the discoveries required to both conquer the technological challenges and also develop industry in space between the Earth and the Moon from the resources that are out there so that we can pay for the scientific exploration of the solar system. Yeah, George, do you want to jump in on that one, the commercial side? Yes, I think the commercial sector is really going to help us to see some new ideas, we'll see some competition, we'll see opportunities for new markets. The government is, is limited on exactly what it does and the budgets that Congress appropriates every year. If we can reach the critical mass of activity levels such that the commercial folks have enough funding through their customers to take care of their planned operations, then the number of launches that we see every year will be reliant on the number of customers rather than on how much Congress appropriates. And that'll be a, a real tipping point in terms of how quickly our programs accelerate. Okay, next question. Uh, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm an educational aide with the Lemelson Center. And this is for all three of you. As Professor Benaroya aptly put it, there has to be an e economical reason uh, for anything to succeed. So outside of research, what would we actually be doing in space? Like what would a normal, what would we do outside of kind of hang out and look at the earth? <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's kind of my question. So NASA has tried to encourage commercial entities to conduct experiments, whether they're medical related or in new materials or crystal growth and all kinds of things and that certainly has a lot of potential but what's exciting to me is I look at the next few years is this brand new market that we've never really had before which is people paying for the opportunity to experience space flight and I, I think there's a lot of folks who would jump at the chance to do that and then we may find some ideas that we hadn't even thought of before as more and more people experience what space is like and bring their own imaginations and ideas to bear. Yeah, I would say that um, certainly um, if you look very long term, um, basically everything we do on Earth, we could, we could do elsewhere. So that it would be basically a whole new economy. Uh, in, the, in the short term and near term, things like space tourism, um, it probably would parallel a lot that was done when, when the West was first settled in this country. You know, you had traders, you had people who went and, and set up camps, and, and they eventually created businesses and, and did things that were, proper, were, pro were profitable. And so I would see that on the moon, uh, and maybe more likely the asteroids, you would see activity that's, that's, that's uh, uh, small, term, small, uh, small time initially, but eventually would be a resource recovery, testing out new, new processes, uh, that take advantage of the hard vacuum or the, or the lower microgravity. So it would basically build up slowly, but eventually it could be a full civilization like we have here on Earth. 
you know, I would like to see the commercial efforts lower the cost of access to space, whether it's early tourism, whether it's space elevators. Uh, if we can lower the cost of access, then companies can build industrial facilities, factories and research labs in space and actually industrialize the space between the Earth and the Moon using the resources and the energy are that, that are there. And that leads, I think, to the potential for really game-changing, I hate that word, but I'll use it anyway, you know, breakthroughs in uh, our way of supplying the Earth with energy, for example. And so if you focus on... Sorry, darn. They must know that I'm up here. <laughs> so, in geosynchronous orbit, 23,000 miles up, if we built a ring one kilometer wide around the entire Earth at that altitude, through that ring every year, we would see enough solar energy passing through that ring to equal all of the world's known oil reserves in one year of sunlight passing through that ring. So the limitless energy supplies that are there seem to me irresistible. And then we can p manufacture the solar collectors, the microwave transmitters, and so on in space, and then beam that energy to the ground. In the 21st century, I think that is the biggest potential for a huge payoff economically. Okay, next question. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is um, Eze St. Cyr. Um, I prefer to study industrial design, but I, I have passion for aerospace engineering. And um, I would hopefully like to add to a legacy somehow. But um, I, I had several questions. I want to know, well, just kind of add to what this last question is, is most people don't realize that the Earth is pretty much like a spaceship. All of our resources are finite on the Earth. A lot of the resources are non-renewable. Non people don't realize that we pretty much are like living, we're like a plant living in a pot. Eventually, the roots will choke ourselves, maybe in another 30 years the Earth's population will double in size, topping off the Earth's capacity to produce resources for all of us. The majority of the reasons why we even have wars is because of lack of resources one way or another. And then, so the other thing is, I think the next evolutionary step is for us to go out to space because if God, well, I don't know, like a black hole or an asteroid or high velocity gamma burst rays is aimed towards the Earth, there's absolutely nothing besides crying out to God, if, if you believe in God to help us. So it seems like the only way for us to live even beyond God knows another hundred years is if we actually migrate out into space so we can essentially spread our, you know, like like pollen does. But another thing I was wondering is why not, um, for instance, we find an asteroid rich in water, which is probably going to be the majority of all of our problems getting into space. It can also absorb radiation as radiation shielding, produce um, rocket fuel, and it can be recycled for plants. When I have like an asteroid be the deep space ship that we're looking for, we can maybe use nuclear reactors for a variety of power conversion energies. And since nuclear reactors have a higher specific impulse um, for certain rocketry, why can't we use that as a means towards deep space and humans can maybe live on this asteroid also? Uh, my cut at that would be that um there are millions of asteroids that are the size of this room or larger in near-Earth space in the inner solar system. So there are many out there to choose from and to use as resources, and I think that's a tremendous potential that we should tap into. But the chances that one is going exactly where you want it to go in its natural orbit are very small. Uh, they typically do not rendezvous with Mars on a regular basis, for example, so it can't be a, a shuttle to Mars unless you have a lot of energy. Uh, an asteroid that's 100 meters across, the size of a football field, weighs a million metric tons. And it takes a lot of rocket power to change that trajectory. So I see it less probable that we'll inhabit asteroids and hollow them out to use as spaceships. More likely that we'll take the valuable materials we find there, like the water, and extract it and then use it in our own spacecraft that we can direct to where we want to go at the right mass. Yeah, I, I would agree with, uh, with Tom. Basically, uh, the asteroids are too big but they are uh, full of resources and there have been some studies where uh, the interior would be hollowed out and, uh, and it would be a temporary base for the miners that would actually s uh, stay there and extract the resources until it's all into them. So the asteroids are a valuable resource to space exploration. And I another question. I want to know more about, like, I'm not sure you guys know, but why did NASA abandon, um, I think it was, was um, Project Pluto, I think it was to create a, a nuclear-powered um, um, 
um, space engine because it has a higher specific impulse, which I mean, you can get to Mars a lot quicker than actually using chemical or anything. I think the the second thing would be the fastest would be the plasma, which is not. I know why it, there's not enough funding for that, but I just want to know like the nuclear powered spaceship would be ideal. I mean, like gamma radiation is way more radiation, way, way, way more radioactive than anything humans can create on Earth. So it, it seemed like the perfect thing, the perfect bus to get us through inner and outer space. Or yeah. Well, we did have in the United States space program test engines in the Nevada desert in around 1970 that were that were reactor powered and could throw hydrogen out the exhaust nozzle at a, twice the efficiency of any chemical engine. And it was very close to actually being space ready. Uh, that program was canceled with the end of the Apollo program because we obviously didn't have the funds in around 1970 to go to back to the moon, let alone go to Mars. Uh, that that nuclear thermal propulsion, I think, is a very high payoff if we can start investing in that technology. That's a, a great way to cut down on the hazards of deep space travel to the asteroids and Mars because it'll speed up the trip times. Uh, but we've got to overcome in this country this phobia about using nuclear for anything. Uh, it's a technology that could be ready within about 10 years to be deployed in space with almost no risk to us here on the ground. It's a great place to use nuclear reactors is out in space away from the Earth. And Vivian, one last question. I, I can go on for years, but um, I just wanted to know about like the X3 project. I think it was one of my favorite um, projects from the whole X legacy because you know it provides almost almost every solution to get things into space or low or low Earth orbit, traveling you know from coast to coast a lot, a lot faster. I just want to know like now with late, later um, newer technology with composites, we didn't really have too much. Acknowledging that back in the 19, in the early late late 70s, early 80s. Now we do. Couldn't it be a good time to revive that project? I know the X45 is doing it, but it's not on the same scale as the National Aerospace Plane, which it was supposed to be. So you're, you're asking about the new advances in material technology? Yes, and also engine and computerization and all other aspects of of technology that has developed since then. To maybe make it a lot more feasible than um, conventional rocket. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of these technologies uh, um, have been developed, and uh, part of the problem is that uh, any technology that goes into space has to be space certified, and um, and so there's something called a TRL technology readiness level that was created uh, to see uh, at what stage some technology is, whether it's still in the research stage or it's a natural, you can take it off the shelf and use it. Uh, uh, you're right that material technology is probably... Uh, the block is kind of held in a... It's kind of held in the ground in the museum. The human applause is dialed. Please go to the security desk. Located in the Watson Center in the Independence Avenue entrance. I guess they think I sound like you. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so I would say that, that material technology is really uh, uh, something that can advance us in all aspects of our uh, society, uh, everything that we do, and certainly in space. Uh, I think part of the part of the problem is that uh, at this point, our national space program is, in a sense, without a specific goal. Uh, and in my view, uh, the specific goal of going to the moon, for example, really organizes everything else we do. Uh, and, and basically prioritizes where we spend our money and our resources because we're trying to solve a specific problem. Uh, and this was uh, discussed a bit in the previous session. Uh, so if you're going to the moon uh, and you want to do it in a certain amount of time under certain budgetary constraints, then you would start picking and choosing where you spend your funds and what kind of research you do. Um, and I would say certainly material science technology uh, is, is a, a key one. And the one I pointed to with the space elevator is based on uh, the nanotechnology revolution of the past decade, carbon nanotubes, all kinds of new materials that are super strong and super light. Uh, so I think, uh, as you alluded to, th that would be uh, a major source of uh, advancement. Thank you, guys. Okay, please tell us who you are. Next question. Uh, my name is David. I'm a student at Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana. I'm studying geology. I had a question. You, uh, you moved kind of quick over the uh, mineralogy slide. 
uh, in the PowerPoint. And I was curious as to sort of the specific minerals that have been uh, found and are, you mentioned how expensive it is to bring materials to, uh, to the moon and sort of which one of these minerals uh, we're thinking that could be the key, be the, you know, the wood that we have on Earth, be the, be this cement almost. Yeah, um, I was pointing to the breakdown of different elements that are available on the lunar surface, and this is based on uh, not only the Apollo sites where they had certain data, but also through um, uh, studies that were done when we sent uh, Clementine and, and other craft around and did uh, radar studies and other kinds of uh, spectro spectroscopic studies. Um, certainly, uh, which, which minerals are important depends on what you're trying to, to do with that. So if you have a, a, a civilization or a settlement even on the moon, you have to have building materials, you have to have oxygen, hydrogen, uh, you have to have uh, water, uh, and so those kind of elements are, are crucial for any, any survival on the lunar surface. So um, one study that, uh, that we're doing now is, is uh, the possibility of using magnesium, which also exists on the lunar surface, as a building material. Uh, and it's, it's very malleable, it has certain properties that, uh, as an alloy, it can be very useful if we're thinking about having an, some automated construction of uh, structures for habitation. So that's one example. So I think uh, each of these is useful for different kinds of applications. Silicon is another element that's available, useful for creating uh, chips, it's useful for other kinds of uh, elements, uh, other kinds of applications as well. Um, so it's they're, they're all useful for different different applications. I was also curious as to, in terms of the creative process with inventing, um, if the world of biomimicry has been applicable for anything NASA related. You may have stumped our panel. Anyone want to take that one? Biomimicry is the sort of this idea, um, sort of one of the early uh, examples of it is the is Velcro, the creation of Velcro. Um, it's this yeah, idea of looking at nature and seeing how nature can solve the problem. Um, and a lot of inventors have been doing it recently on issues with Earth and uh, environmentally sustainable uh, architecture and whatnot. And I was wondering if, you know, when we look at the whole world and worlds above us, if as inventors, you guys are looking to how, how nature can solve it, how nature can, uh, can somehow uh, I don't know, you know, how does nature create those caves and how can we uh, applicate those uh, processes to humans? Well, thanks for the good question. I, you know, I learned a new term. I appreciate that. Um, what I would respond with in terms of how we can uh, take advantage of something we see it on the ground here that might help us in space, the best example I can think of is uh, plant growth. And you know, we're, as I showed in the slide, there's small little growth chambers on the space station uh, where we're seeing how plants can survive in free fall. If, that, if the problem of fertilizing and supplying water to and providing the right gas mixture to plants can be solved on the space station, then we might think of greenhouses uh, in space on the station, attached to the station at the Lagrange points around the Earth and Moon, on the lunar surface, on cruise vehicles going to Mars someday. And rather than have these elaborate mechanical systems to extract carbon dioxide from the air to keep the crew alive, to recycle water, to um, you know, have stored food that you have to rehydrate, and you have to have tons of it for a voyage to Mars for each individual, if we could use just plants to solve the life support problems, extracting CO2, giving off oxygen, uh, handling water filtration and purification, and then providing a food source. I think that's just a, a, a tremendous opportunity. And we're just starting to scratch the surface of that on the space station, but I know that um, folks who go to Antarctica to the South Pole say that their most popular room in the entire South Pole outpost is the greenhouse. So it's a psychological relief as well as just the, the mechanical functions of staying alive. It's a great, great area to explore. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I think we have time for one last question, so please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Jim. I'm a docent here at the museum. Uh, Dr. Smith, Harrison Smith from Apollo 17, advocated 
the use of the regolith and, and the, the resources there to power for energy for here on Earth. Although some people would say that the, the treaty that we have, we don't use it for Earth purposes. Do you think that would be a one an obstacle, or isn't that a an economical way to get the economics going of allowing something like that to occur to get that economic engine going? Right. He he, uh, he proposed using helium three for nuclear fusion reaction, uh, of which uh, helium three is available in very large quantities on the moon, but not on the Earth. Uh, so certainly, if, if if nuclear fusion uh, is is figured out, uh, then then that's certainly uh, more than enough reason to go to the moon and, and bring back uh, even one ton would be, would pay for uh, all the energy the Earth needs for a whole year. Um, nuclear fusion is probably several decades away, so so uh, I would I would think, uh, as Tom mentioned earlier, that uh, space solar power would be one viable uh, way to uh, to pay for. Uh, going into space. Uh, Shimizu, the, the Japanese construction company, has a concept where they would lay out very large solar panels as a ribbon around the moon and then beam that energy back to Earth, thus paying for all the, all the expenses there. And, and some have even proposed just melting the regolith into, uh, into uh, and using the silicon that's on the surface and creating these panels directly in, in the soil itself. There's no additional structure that has to be made. So a lot of ideas and energy certainly is one way by which uh, a lot of the costs of the of, of just getting to the moon and building facilities could be paid off. The trick is sort of uh, making it uh, making it pay for waiting for the payment back for decades, and, and that's always been the problem with space. You know, if, if you stipulate uh, being there, like what's going to happen in 20 years, that you can make a, a case for it. But those first 20 years is where the problem comes, and so the government private enterprise model is, uh, is probably the way that this can, this can be feasible. But that's a, a definite thing that uh, Harrison recommended. I would just add that we should be building uh, a microwave transmitter, transport it to the space station, use the solar power at the space station to transmit a few watts down to the ground as a demonstration of space-based solar power collection and transmission to Earth. And then you scale that up to a free-flying satellite in low Earth orbit that does the same thing. And you put it in geosynchronous orbit for the cost of about Ten billion dollars over ten years, you could have a demonstration solar power satellite in geosynchronous orbit, and then solve or answer the question as to whether that's an economically viable model. And that's what the government should be doing: is showing whether the process is feasible and economical or not. Then you turn it over to industry and have them have you know form utility companies and establish utilities in space to supply that power. That's the only way to get off the get over the obstacle of the capital costs up front. Well, I guess we'll have to see in the next uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Hey, thanks everyone in the audience for your terrific questions, and let's uh, please join me in thanking our terrific panelists.